He reminds me a bit of Donovan and T-Rex. James Buckman is an up-and-coming glam singer who rocks to his own style. He's done a few things, too. He's appeared on Canada's Got Talent and an episode of a television reality show. You can find him in the Toronto club scene and through all the usual music places. Please welcome James Buckman. Hello. <laughs> I feel very welcome. So what was it like growing up where you did? Um, man, I had the best kind of upbringing. I grew up on this like tiny little like dead end street that was like just far enough from like downtown to have its own sort of enclosed environment, but like close enough to like be reachable to reach anything. I had like so many kids on my street. Uh, there were no cars. We just like play out in the street and like forests behind our house and all that. So it was a really awesome place to grow up. I might've been too young to have a sort of larger sense of the world outside of my own little environment. Were you always into music or did that come later? I think I was always into performing. I spent like my summers at like theater camps and things like that. I vaguely remember being in some, like my like one of my earliest memories of performing is being in a, cowboy musical at some drama camp when I was like five or six uh singing happy trails that might be like my earliest memory of any sort of performance vividly I remember being in sixth grade and just having so much like restless energy that I got into admittedly like bad habit of jumping up on my table in the middle of class and uh, singing an offspring song which was like the first rock song i like oh i wish uh, there was a video of that <laughs> uh, yeah my teacher uh was not pleased um but i suppose i didn't have enough outlets for performance at that point and so it just manifested in uh just any other sort of spontaneous attention seeking behavior and then uh, everything like coalesced when i realized oh uh I, I meant to like be on stage. I meant to like perform rock and roll. I mean, the other like fondness I always had was writing and uh, specifically poetry was a passion for me. And so I'd often like write poems. And when I discovered, oh, like, even if I'm not like, I wasn't blessed with a huge amount of innate instrumental talent. I was given like piano lessons because of the sort of culture in which I was raised. I never did terribly well with them. Took clarinet and eventually drums and music class. I wasn't excellent at either. I still enjoyed bits of it, but I wasn't any great prodigy at any sort of instrument. And, uh, but like, I really did have an affinity for writing poetry. And when I got to the age around middle school or high school, when all of my peers thought it was cool to have a band, they looked at me and thought, well, all right, you're not great at like any sort of instrument and we hate your singing voice, but you have a drum kit at home because you know, that's what you do in band class and your lyrics rock. So just keep the beat in our band on the drums and, and we'll use your lyrics because they're fire. And uh, that's how I got into it. Eventually I realized that I was the only one in any of my social groups with any real drive to take the music thing anywhere. A lot of my friends just wanted to, you know, get inebriated in, someone's basement and jam on the same like Neil Young song for 45 minutes instead of actually writing songs and playing shows. After a few experiences like that, I decided, all right, I'm going to have to start my own band. And since there's no one around to tell me not to sing, I'm just going to sing because that's what I love doing. Despite not having a natural classically like trained or, uh, Voice, uh, yeah. A preachable voice just got better through sheer stubbornness. And it turned out to be like the perfect voice for what I do. Some training sense to expand like my range and versatility. And that's helped. But also what I do feel very thankful for, something that can't really be taught. And that's a unique sound, which has always been the thing that resonates yeah. with me when I hear other singers. Like I'm not specifically drawn to virtuosity in anyone's voice. I can appreciate it to some extent, but I really just dig people who have 
like some sort of edge to their voice, regardless of their level of like objective vocal ability, if that's even a thing. Like, you know, like you listen to like Bob Dylan or you mentioned T-Rex, like Mark Boland, like those dudes, no one really sounds like them. But, no, you know, that's uh, true. They're like very, I mean, Mark Boland, I think a lot of people would say he's the better traditional singer, whereas Bob Dylan is very avant-garde in his delivery. But like both of them are examples of people who have like mouth sounds that just stick in my head and get like glued to my heart because of how you need a sound. And when I hear people say the same thing about my voice, I appreciate it, but I can't really take credit for it because it was just something I had from the beginning. And I just got better at delivering it in a way that was resonant to others, I suppose. Yeah, we're all works in progress. We all improve as we go on and practice makes perfect. <laughs> so when you're performing in the clubs and, and live in front of people, do you do, especially in a club gig, do you have to play top 40 or can you play your own original songs? I've never done anything uh, that apart from my original songs. Oh, I, especially since when I was starting out and I really didn't have much faith in my voice, I thought, well, it felt like a bit of a waste to, because I like my, when I started out, like my main strength, my only strength, well, my main strength was, was my lyricism. And I also had great on stage presence, but I just, I thought that it was a bit of a waste to sing someone else's words when my words were what got me there in the first place. Also, it's like, in the, like local music scene, you're given like 30 to 60 minutes to play your set. And I have so many songs. I have like dozens, if not hundreds of songs I want to play. And at an average concert, I'm probably playing like 10. I don't want to like cut any more of my songs to, mm -hmm. to make way for someone else's. There are like exceptions, you know, it's like there are like conditions. I mean, we are, recently I was featured on a radio show called Canadian Classics. That was a segment of the radio show. And it was getting like modern Canadian artists to cover like Canadian like hits and that before like playing their own stuff. So I played, my, my band played a cover of a uh, Metrics Monster Hospital mm -hmm. um, before they played one of our singles. So there are reasons to do it, but in the absence of a good reason, I'm always going to stick to my original stuff. Now, that might mean they're definitely like uh, well paying gigs and a steady stream of them for people who play originals or for people who play like top 40 or whatever. And I respect that. I've even played with people who have that as a side hustle, but it's not for me personally. It's got to be hard. Like from the scene in Alberta, like from back from the early days in the 80s when I was kind of in every club. Um, there was a lot of live bands in just about every club. And then they cut back and went, in, went to the DJ. And now it's really rare to find a club that has live bands. There's not a whole lot of them. What about in Toronto or in Ontario? That's still a thing where it's really hard to get a gig if you're a live band, particularly if you do original stuff. Or do you find kind of like underground places to play and, and create your own venue? <laughs> There are always places to play. Some of them are bigger than others. Some of them are quite big. And there is a, a pretty lively music scene, but that also means there are like a ton of bands. So it's like, especially when you're starting out, finding the right places to play is perhaps not the easiest task. I will say this, even before the whole like lockdown situation in 2020 that, that shut a lot of businesses, a lot of the live music institutions of the city were closing down. Fortunately, others came up to pick up the slack. And then now it's getting back to a pretty good place again. There's still some complications, but it's doing all right. I will say one of the biggest, uh, most like, successful venues basically split the difference between supporting live music and making that uh, easy DJ money. There's this place called Sneaky D's, which is actually one of my favorite places to perform at and just to dance at. What they do, they start their live music event at six so that they're done by 10. And then right at 10, the DJ sets up and, and plays, you know, whatever music. And that like guarantees 
like a hefty take for the rest of the night, even if like the local bands wow, they booked that's, earlier. That's actually pretty unique. Really... Cause yeah. usually you and... have to wait till like nine o'clock before the, the band starts. Yeah, no, it works out. And there have been times when I played there and then I like the music they're playing afterwards. They'll stick around and dance. It's a great place. And also they have a restaurant underneath mm -hmm. and I'm not big on like eating at restaurants, but everyone I know says they have the best nachos perhaps in the country. You don't have to Not wait outside shy. at the two closing time and get the hot dog cart outside the bar. <laughs> no, there are that. And that's the thing. I noticed this every club, every like cool club in the city seems to have an A and W right outside it. I don't know why that specific <laughs> chain seems to be like near every like alternative club. But are but they open I, till two and three in the morning? That's the key. I think they're open through the night. Yeah. Cause I always leave them around like two 30 and, and they're still open. So how do you it's book loud. your gigs? Do you do it yourself or do you have someone doing it for you? So I'm in a position where I'm basically doing everything. It's funny cause we you know we're artists and we have the creative side of things on lock, but uh, the sort of business aspect of things that's mm -hmm. tougher to get a handle on. So. We're just like doing what we can by ourselves. We don't have any like professional management right now. I am the closest thing we have to a manager, which, uh, you know, we're getting through it. It's just probably uh, a bit of a foggier endeavor than it otherwise would be if we had someone who like really knew what they were doing. So you write a lot of poetry and I'm assuming that's what you put to music. So what's the process like of creating those songs? You and your members get together and just kind of hang for the day to put it together or is there a pro specific process that you go through there are several versions of the process yeah. they're like there are several ways to write songs and we've probably done all or at least most of them it differs so sometimes i'll get really excited about some new yorks i just wrote and i'll bring it to the band and say hey jam on this for a while let's like come up with a riff let's let's like figure out a way to like make this into an awesome song sometimes someone in the band will get really excited about a tune they like you know we're playing guitar and i'll write something for that or it'll remind me of some poem i had written ages ago and i'll realize oh this fits perfectly with that or sometimes we'll just be like warming up for rehearsal and someone will be like noodling on on a guitar and i'll say wait what does that sound really cool and we'll write a song off that uh, so those are probably the three commonest ways for us to write songs is there a lot of you in your writing uh, almost nothing but me, if I understand <laughs> the question right. That's what I love about what I'm doing. It's like, I get to like channel my soul straight out into the cosmos, you know, through music, through art, through, through poetry. And that's just unadulterated self-expression. And that's honestly what, what art is to me. And that's what this band is to me. It's even more beautiful in a way, because I get to collaborate on it with these wonderful artists around me in the band. Who is your inspiration for music today? The most honest response would be me. But I, I will say that. this. There was a time when I'd been disillusioned through those high school experiences with bandmates who just didn't have the passion to actually pursue anything. And just focus on poetry for a while because that was something I could do by myself and when I was, I was like 17 or whatever, I thought, well, if I don't, if I don't need to collaborate with anyone else, I'll never be let down by someone else. And they realized, well, that's, that's a stupid way to look at things. I had friends who said, well, they want to stop dating because they're sick of being disappointed. And it's like, if something's important to you, you'll get through the disappointment. It was a, a, as I was like, as my mind was subconsciously processing a return to music, it was also grappling with the fact that like, I couldn't really play an instrument and I didn't have any sort of natural voice. Like even like people like Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen could at least like write music on guitar. Right. And I couldn't even do that at the time. So I thought, well, is there anyone who only has like stage presence and lyricism? And I thought Iggy Pop only has that. Mm -hmm. And he's made a successful career in rock music for several decades so if that dude can do it like i'll give it a shot Iggy e pop was probably like the final catalyst that helped me decide to pursue music and after that i never looked back and i also i later learned that he actually started out 
in a very similar way to me, he also started out in high school bands as a drummer who couldn't really drum very well. Uh, so yeah, that, that hit me, that point of coincidence. So yeah, I love that dude. He's probably one of my biggest motivators, external motivators for getting into singing specifically. Now we see the punk glam, glam metal, hard metal. They seem to get a bum rap from all the talent shows and the award shows. What was your experience like on Canada's Got Talent? Because it's something that I'm sure that they weren't quite into as well. It was a fun experience, but I just remember I prepared this song. I working on love. It was the second single from our uh, 2022 album. It was, I think, shortly before we released a music video for it. So like, I, it was basically being debuted for the first time on the show. Uh, that was gutsy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was an awesome song. Bit of like kind of a dance rock feel, kind of like almost a bit of like new wave. I got started on singing it. And uh, I think I got to the end of the chorus before like one of the judges had to say, like, you realize we buzzed you like 20 seconds ago. <laughs> Apparently they, they buzzed me like pretty early in the first verse. Oh. And I just didn't notice because when I'm performing, I am like even more like unaware of my surroundings and uh, I'm just like completely immersed in the performance. <laughs> that's and, awesome. uh, and that's I, was just, I was just like, you know, uh, that's honestly performing my music is a pleasure unlike any other in my life. So I was just like in pure ecstasy and the apparent the loud buzzer that everyone else in the theater must have been hearing for like, you know, uh, <laughs> 20 seconds at least or whatever, um, heard it. And I just, I it did not break through. So paint me a picture of what your perfect music venue looks like. Just big, I guess. I, I want to share my music with more people. I want to be in front of more eyes. Like my perfect... The music venue has, you know, those like screens at like the big amphitheaters mm -hmm. where they'll like be like close up shots of the band to the people in the cheap seats. I want a venue with screens that do that for like the people on the other end of the galaxy. Like that's my goal. So that, that would be perfect for me. Like I don't want to be beamed to other dimensions, but I kind of think, oh, you know what? But in this sort of more terrestrial frame of reference, I think it'd be really awesome to play I went on this trip with my family and my friend when I was a kid to Italy and we saw like the old like Colosseums, the ruins of these like ancient Roman sports venues. And I think it'd be awesome playing one of those. So, or like some ancient temple, like a pyramid, you yeah. know, I think that'd be epic. I think that's what I'd like to do at some point if I can swing it. If you could choose anyone in the world, past or present, which musician would you like to collaborate with? So I don't know why this got in my head, but once someone asked me, if you were forced to do a cover, what song would you cover? And I thought for some reason, I would like to collaborate on a cover of Bang Gong with Debbie Harry. I don't know oh. why that occurred to me, but it's always been something that sounds amazing in my head. Like I, I want to listen to a collaboration between Debbie Harry and James Buckman on Mark Boland's Bang and Gong. I don't know why that is, but I still want to make it happen because I would I would really dig on that track. Crazier well, things like, have happened, right? <laughs> yeah, I want to make it happen. Um, Debbie Harry, if you're listening, and I know you are, give me a call. <laughs> that would be awesome. I mean, I love her just because, again, I think her career speaks to the importance of stubbornness in art because yeah. she wasn't one of those singers who strikes big time like right after high school or whatever. She was playing the local scene for years before she got anywhere, and then she got everywhere, you know? Music, it particularly, it should be all-encompassing. It shouldn't just all be safe. <laughs> it should be like, we talked before the show, before I hit the record button, we talked about Rough Trade and some bands and lyrics that were kind of shocking that they got airplay. But really, when, when you look at music, it should kind of encompass everything and every mixing genres and mixing singers that you would never, ever think of being together, like Lady Gaga and Tony, <laughs> the crooner. So what is your favorite band that really pushes that envelope or a singer? Hmm. 
I love Cardi not... B's WAP. <laughs> oh. The first thing that comes to mind, the first thing I remember hearing about, I remember when I was a kid, someone showed me a collaboration uh, between Aerosmith and Run DMC uh, yes. for a cover of Walk This Way. Yes. And that's probably like not like terribly like transgressive or shocking by today's standards. But I remember being told that it was a pretty historic moment it was. because it was fusing rock and roll, which was like a genre that had been around for decades and was easily understood by the masses with what like rap, which was new to like most of the traditional like music audience of the time, mm-hmm. side of specific uh, subcultures. I loved it even then, like when I was first shown it. So that, that stuck with me. It's just an awesome song. And also Run DMC might still be my favorite rap group. I just, speaking about unique voices, um, I'm not the greatest of names, but I'm pretty sure DMC is the one, the way he delivers his lyrics, it feels to me like peanut butter bullets. Like <laughs> they're punchy, but there's like a stickiness to them. And I just, I love that because he doesn't sound like any other rapper I've heard. I love his delivery, uh, his rhythm and everything. So it's like I run DMC like by themselves are like de- still my favorite actor to this day. Despite the fact that I think they'd like broken up like long before I was born. When you pair them with Aerosmith, who are like just a great theatrical rock band in their own right, it is like a, a beautiful marriage. So what's next for uh, James and uh, Pot Apollo? In the immediate future, we have two big shows coming up. On the 25th of March, we are playing a special charity concert uh, at Duffy's Tavern for the Sophie Lancaster uh, Foundation, which aims against violence and is specifically inspired by this young girl named Sophie Lancaster, who was beaten quite violently just for walking around uh, her, her city in the manner of a goth. You know, we're playing a charity event for that with a few other awesome events. The 31st, we are playing The Rock Pile. Uh, Currently, we're getting in the studio to record our second full-length album, which should be out by the end of 2023. Those are our, like, current immediate plans. Ultimately, we're just keeping on with our plan to save the world through rock and roll. I love that. Save the world through rock and roll. What a great way to end this. Thank you so much. And if you want to find any of our stuff, look for Hot Apollo anywhere. iTunes, Bandcamp, Spotify, all social media, just Hot Apollo, H-E-O-T, H-O-T-A-P-O-L-L-O. I'll have the links in this video too. That's awesome. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure.